Are you still there? I'm, I'm still here, yeah. Okay, I'm going to figure out why we can't see you, but I'll let you maybe debrief everybody else. Oh, there you are, you flipped away. Yeah, I, can, I, I keep flipping back and forth, and what I'm wondering is if you can see me and the PowerPoint, or if you can only see the PowerPoint or only, only me. So what are you seeing at that end? We just see you. Oh, all right, because I, uh, I have a nice PowerPoint here. Uh, I'm trying to get on, uh, make it visible to all of you. I got that last night, uh, and unfortunately I didn't have a chance to print it, but I will print it at lunchtime for you guys and email everybody a copy of the slides as well. So. Yeah, because I, I have it here showing, and then there's the question as to how to get it to show up on, uh, on, the, on the Hangout. And uh, let's see if there's a way to get that to happen. I figure, okay, I see you now. So there's just the two of us. <laughs> there, there's a... My fabulous tech gentleman is going to try to figure out the webcam for us. Uh, I'm going to just hop off for a moment to see. Uh, I, I, there should be someone here at the university who can tell me how to get it to show up. So how to how to get it so that you can see uh, the PowerPoint as well. So uh, don't let anybody get away. Yeah, I'll be right back. My presentation that I'm running my own anyway. So thanks for your flexibility. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yes, you can laugh at me, it's fine. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh. I laugh at me all the time. It's fine. Mm. All right. I haven't been able to get I haven't been able to get that one. No, okay. I'll just no get can we hook up the other computer? This has a webcam just turned around. All right. So yeah. these uh, the slides that I've got here, um, I'm really just wanting to go through, um, how many of you are, I, I wanted to share with you a lot of the other initiatives that are happening with Autism Speaks right now. Um, there's a bit of a misnomer, and before I get into all of these promotions, I want to share with, uh, I want to do a poll. So how many of you guys, and give me your honest answer, believe that if you go raise a bunch of money in Saskatoon, it's going to go all back into the bad house and the school and then it's going to affect your community and go mostly to the US. Be honest with me. Do you think that right now? Okay. Before you leave, you will know better. Uh, I, I'll just share a little tidbit with you and as the day goes by, I'll, I'll explain all of the information here. Uh, the scientific research that has been funded uh, in Canada and I can prove it to you, the math is very simple. 12 million in uh, 12 million dollars, uh, 1.6 million dollars we raised over five walks last year in 2012, right? In Canada, we have funded over 12 million dollars worth of scientific research in Canadian researchers. Happening at the University of Toronto, U of A, U of C, we need to get some research going on at the U.S. because the U.S. is an amazing institution. So that in itself, okay, 12 million, or you only raised 1.6. Doing it, doing it. Where does that money coming from? We get far, far more dollars from the U.S. than every dollar we raise in Canada stays in Canada, and I'm not even talking about our capital rules side. I just did the scientific research at home. So uh, one of the handouts that are all going to take is um, it's there's a two-sided forum that um, has the scientific uh, research that we funded um, 2011 to 
2012, and then I do have one with the TAN, as well as a summary of all of them if you'd actually like to know more, I can have that available for you. And then on the other side of the document, it is the family services thing, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. Are you ready to rock back? Yeah, I'm just about ready. Um, okay. I, um, I'm just going to keep going and just yell, okay? And okay, go. all right. So the reason I brought that up right now is how many of you guys heard of the sales people promotion, people's promotion that's happening right now? So everybody, these promotions come up, and I even remember thinking before I was training for like, well, what if I want to tell my mom who lives in Calgary to go buy a, a autism speaks heart for her, her grandma for her, her sister for her birthday because the dollar that goes to autism speaks. So I used to think that goes to the autism speaks in the US. We are getting that back tenfold in the industry in research. So Zales and Peoples has um, promotions that are happening right now with jewelry. Uh, this is actually um, a promotion that, an advertisement that, and um, I've got the old picture on here, I couldn't get it in time to update it, but uh, Tennis Canada uh, did a big, large fundraising tournament for us and um, did a big, bad campaign. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. How many of you heard about Bill Bear? Woo! How many of you went and got Bill Bear? Yay! So you just find the Canadian movie science for research there. So uh, there's Connor and I with his bill bear. Um, I think the Saskatoon store still has some bears left. I believe. I called them. So if you're still wanting to do that. Um, so it's a dollar from every bear and then 50 cents from that cool little t-shirt. Okay. I just have a fun little video here for you and uh, Stephen's not there. You guys have all heard about Light That Blue, right? How many of you knew that initiative was truly started by Autism Speaks? Okay. I want to show you a neat little video here. And then, uh, this was actually produced uh, for this year. Greetings from the International Space Station. This is astronaut Tom Marshford. I can try. All of us are here to be waiting for the world of light of blue on April 2nd for World of Light of Blue. This year, they have been able to find a new world of light of blue. And for one of the years, they have been able to find a new world of light of blue. Okay, we're almost ready. We're going to stay with your friends on the International Space Station. We shall leave all those who are celebrating. I just put that up because I have to confirm that it was on the internet. I don't know. Cool, eh? Okay, I'm ready when you are. Are you ready when you are? Okay, I'll show you my little video later. Do you try? We just have to put our project back, Stephen. All right, so let me know when you're ready. We're ready, and you're on. Okay, well, let's let the fun begin. Uh, if it's, uh, I wonder if it's possible to turn the computer around so I can see the audience. So I can I'm see on it already. All right, way to go. Oh, and there everybody is. Great to see you all. <laughs> and then, all right, you see everybody there. The, the computer is... Yeah, I have heard my introduction, Stephen, but can we give Stephen a huge round of applause for doing this for that for the big one class? All right, that looks much better. I had a great view of the ceiling, and now I can see everybody there, so that's good to see. So let us begin. Uh, uh, we're going to uh, yeah, let, let's start the presentation, and we'll let the fun we'll let the fun begin. And we'll just wait for the computer to do its thing, and there it is. So uh, before we continue. Uh, I take it everybody can see everything. Marcy, is everything in good order? Yes, sir. I just don't. Can you make the slides bigger? Like, do a full view of your PowerPoint? Ah, uh, well, slide. I'm. I have a. I have a full view of the PowerPoint. Or I'm seeing a full view of the PowerPoint here. Can you go like go to your slideshow and just put like full screen or something? Uh, let's see. It is the whole screen actually. Well, let's see if there's something else that could be done here. Okay. 
Now that's as big as it gets within the PowerPoint. But if I show the PowerPoint, um, okay. I was looking, it's looking pretty big over here. It looks like it is the whole screen, at least from my end. I'm going to show you what we see with the webcam. Okay. Ooh. Oh, you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, it's too bright, I guess. We're getting the speaker notes. He's getting the slideshow. Yeah, we're getting the speaker notes, and you're getting the slideshow. It's okay. Just I think you should begin, and I'm going to get everybody a hard copy in front of them, like. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll let the fun begin. And let us just uh, start this off. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk to you about uh, how you can put the good work that Autism Speaks is doing in terms of research and seeing what can be done to help people with autism lead fulfilling and productive lives. Uh, Marcy uh, brought up a lot of good topics during her introduction and uh, what's being done, so that was uh, that was good to hear, and in particular the uh, toolkits that Autism Speaks has. I think are uh, very encouraging and very helpful uh, for those of us on the autism spectrum and for those who support individuals uh, with autism. So we're going to begin at the uh, at the very beginning, and the question is, what do we what are we doing now that has implications for adult life? And I think that's important to keep in mind because when we think of transition, it has to go way beyond the idea of starting at age 16 at the very end of high school. And I always question why do we spend only two or three years uh, preparing the individual for the rest of their lives, for the rest of their 80%, 70 80% of their lives. We spend 70 to 80 percent of our lives as adults, and uh, we should really should be starting transition as soon as we know somebody is on the autism spectrum. So, what are we doing now that has implications for adult life in terms of biomedical interventions, behavioral, developmental? and educational interventions, as well as sensory. And these seem to be the three big areas that we see individuals on the autism spectrum uh, needing intervention. And the question is, as we're doing that, we need to keep in mind all the other aspects of adult life. And the other aspects of adult life and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, change uh, uh, change PowerPoints because this one seems to be seems to have too many elements flying around. So let's see if I can find another one. Let's try this one. Now we're waiting for this one to pop up. Here it is. And uh, let's see what we've got here. Uh, we're going to share the screen. And here we are again. And I think this will be a little bit easier to work with. As we look at the interventions in the three major areas, as we help those of us on the autism spectrum, lead fulfilling and productive interdependent lives. And I use the word interdependent because as far as I know, only hermits live independently. The rest of us live interdependently. We appropriately depend on other people to, for example, uh, build our houses that we live in. And what are we going to do to help the individual with autism live as interdependently as possible? Employment. Most of us have to work for a living, and that includes those of us with autism. Relationships of all kinds. 
continuing education, as well as effective skills, developing effective skills in self-advocacy and disclosure. So moving along, we're going to take a look at autism from the inside. We're going to start at the very beginning. And when I mean the beginning, I'm talking about the start. Things were pretty typical for me for the first 18 months. Then uh, my mother just had a two-hour labor. At 24 hours of age, my wife says I look like an egg. Then, at 18 months, what I call the autism bomb exploded. There was a loss of functional communication, meltdowns, tantrums, withdrawal from the environment. So in short, I became a very autistic little kid. There was very little information known at that time. It took my parents a whole year to find a place for diagnosis. And as we think back then, and as we do now, uh, we still have a lot of questions as to where autism comes from, what can we do about it. Some questions have been answered, and there's many more that we're still researching into, ranging from what the causes of autism are, all the way to helping those of us with autism lead fulfilling and productive lives. So this becomes especially important as we see an ever-increasing number of people being diagnosed on the autism spectrum. A generation ago, the prevalence rate was about 1 in 10,000, but now we have new figures suggesting 1 in 50. So that's 1, that's 2%. And we have the age-old question as to whether there's more autism as it seems to be delivered to us on a Federal Express truck daily, or could it be that uh, we're better at recognizing autism when we see it? And if we add to that, uh, we've expanded the definition of what autism is, uh, that, that really suggests that perhaps it's somewhere in the middle. Maybe there is more of it, but at the same time we may be better at recognizing it. All I know is that all through grade school I was the only child I knew with autism, and if I, even if I think about my classmates who probably should have been diagnosed but weren't, it doesn't account for the fact that we have entire schools dedicated to children you know, with pervasive developmental disorders and classrooms and in schools develop, uh, dedicated to children who are on the autism spectrum. So there seems to be a lot of it. And, you know, as we think about whether we're better at recognizing it, that does bring to mind Federal Express. And the reason why I think about Federal Express is as you look at the logo of Federal Express, some of you may not have noticed the arrow between the E and the X. Now it's just part of the regular white space, so it's hard to notice unless I highlight it by that green arrow. But once I take that green arrow away, you still that? notice the arrow. Say that again? Do you see me waving? I'm trying to get your attention. So oh, I'm sorry, I can't see you. <laughs> the slides that everybody sees are just still your in your first slide. There we go. Um, and the, I've had a request, you know, on your screen, on the Hangout, people would like to see you. So we see a big version and then the slides in the little. Can you make Oh, that would, be, that would be great uh, if we could do that. Um, uh, what I've... Uh, what I realized is that if we want to see both me and the and the slides, that we're going to have to I'm, I'm going to have to share the PowerPoint with you on a uh, Google on a Google Drive. Do you have a Google Drive? They're all going to have a hard copy of the slides in. 10 minutes anyway, so we'll just keep going this way, but yeah, just make sure you flip the slides as you talk because it's stuck. Oh, okay. All right, because I've been, I've been flipping the slides, but I guess it hasn't gone through. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let's just try, let's just try an experiment. Uh, I'm going to go to a slide, and let me know if you can see them being, if you can see them being flipped through. 
Now we see you. Now you see me. And it's starting the screen share. Now what do you see? The baby slide. Okay, you see the baby slide. And now what do you see? The yellow slide with colors. <laughs> I can't read it from here. Oh, okay. All right, so various colors. And now what do you, now what do you see? The same one as last time. Very so there aren't any changes to the slide? No. Well, that's interesting because the wording went on. So there's no changes. What color is the slide now? Yellow. With black and gray. With black and gray at the top. The one before the blue one. It's your second slide. Okay, so you're not seeing the blue slide. No. Nope. All right, then we're going to have to drastic times call for drastic measures. Now we see blue. Now you see blue. Yeah. Uh, and you see a bunch of other slides on the left? Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's... Um, all right, then uh, I guess this is what we're going to... We'll have to use this, which is... Uh, not quite what PowerPoint is uh, made to be used for, but uh, at least it uh, at least it's giving us uh, a sense of you know, uh, what we need to be looking at. So I am going to go and uh, pull up a a file that perhaps will work better uh, for these purposes. So we're on our way. Okay, here we go. And I think this one will work pretty well for what I'm uh, for what I was uh, talking about. So now you see the uh, now you see the cover slide with the title. We see still a blue slide. You still see a blue slide? Yeah, How about now? Now what do you see? Still the same. Still the same. Because now I have a yellow slide. Hmm. You know, I have an idea. Let's vote. Do we want to see the slides or Stephen? Put your hand up for Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, you win. I'm, the slides are being printed as we speak, and everybody's going to have a hard copy in front of them in a few minutes. So they want to see your pretty face. Oh, they want to. They want to see me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's um. Let's try one more thing. I figure you can't figure it out. I won't. <laughs> yeah, there were some additional steps that we needed to take that I I didn't realize we needed to do. Um, just out of curiosity, what slide do you see now? Little about me. Okay, uh, and yeah. now what do you see? A baby. Now what do you see? It's interacting now, like as you click it's adding. Oh, okay, so you have a, now, now you see the autism bomb. Yep. Oh, okay. All right, I think we got it working. Woohoo! Yeah. Should we move it up, everybody? It's being very patient. Yeah. Woohoo! Okay. I'll do some extra door press drugs. Just to do that. All right, so here we are, and uh, there I was at 24 hours of age when I did look like an egg, and... Is your way of saying we don't get to see you? Well, uh, we'll flip back and forth. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, so here's the autism bomb I was talking about uh, when I was hit with the autism bomb and became a very autistic little kid. Uh, here's, the Fed, here's the FedEx logo that I was talking about and the idea that if I show you where that arrow is between the E and the X, some of you may have noticed it before and some of you may not have, and for those who haven't noticed the arrow, now you do, so even if it disappears, you still see that it exists. And the idea is that just like you've been primed to diagnose white space arrows 
in uh, Federal Express logos, maybe society is better able to see autism uh, when it sees it. But we're still not entirely sure if that accounts for all of the increase that we've been seeing in autism. So as we roll along, now, uh, as we talk about the uh, uh, about autistic characteristics, as we talk about people with autism, I think one thing that we need to get away from is the, is the deficit model we use for diagnosis and for intervention. And what I mean by that is that when a child is diagnosed, the first thing a parent hears are all the things that their child won't be able to do. And that's pretty scary. And in education, teachers are told about all the weaknesses their students with autism will have, and this is what we need to do to remediate them. Now that's not to say that the challenges of autism are not there, they're real, they're significant, uh, they, are, they create huge challenges uh, for individuals, families, and societies. If they didn't, then Autism Speaks and various other organizations, we wouldn't be here trying to figure it out. However, it's also important to realize that there may be strengths uh, in people uh, with autism. Now, how do we access those strengths? Well, let's take a look at what my parents did. Um, in those days, again, there was very little known about autism. Uh, my parents took a full year, it took them a full year to find a place for diagnosis. When they did, the doctor said they had never seen a child who was so sick and they recommended institutionalization. But fortunately, my parents, like so many of you who are sitting in the audience today, they advocated on my behalf and they convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during that year that my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program emphasizing music, movement, sensory integration, narration, and imitation. So the question is, uh, what did they do that we can look at, perhaps we can learn something that we can do to help people with autism today? Well, first my parents tried to get me to imitate them, and that didn't work. So then they flipped it around, and they began to imitate me. And once they did that, I became aware of them in my environment. And in that way, uh, they built a trusting relationship, and then we're able to move on. And I think that's the important educational implication, is that before any good learning goes on, you have to develop a good, good and trusting relationship with that individual. So that by the time age four rolled around, speech had begun to return, and I got admitted to that special school that initially rejected me. I got reevaluated. Instead of being considered as psychotic and ready for an institution, I got upgraded to neurotic. So things were moving up in the world. And in that way, I believe that we have the technology, we have the ability, we have the know-how. So the people with autism leading fulfilling and productive lives can become the rule rather than the exception. And that perhaps autism doesn't have to be such a bomb. And instead of being a bomb, maybe autism can become da bomb. <laughs> so then the question is, how can autism be da bomb? Let's take a look at, at an example of Takeshi, who's an adult, a young adult on the autism spectrum, providing transportation system information to lost patrons at Shinjuku Station in Tokyo. And here, uh, we look at the characteristics of autism, the characteristics we know all too well, the areas of communication, social interaction, and restricted interest, as we see in the DSM-4. The questions are, what implications do they have for employment? And we're going to take a look. If we think about the communication people with autism who are verbal, that suggests uh, if we know those who know people with Asperger syndrome, 
that the communication is detailed, factual, data-driven, truthful, repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. And if we think about how many of you have been lost and you've asked someone to repeat directions, well, that works really well. If we think about social interaction, there's a myth that those of us on the autism spectrum don't want to interact. I think what really happens is that attempts to interact are so disastrous that after a number of bad experiences, people with autism just give up. So what can we do in terms of improving social interaction and success? Uh, we're going to look at that more at that later. But generally, we do know now that if social interaction is predictable, in some cases if it's limited, in the case of this position where there's a short greeting, customer says hello, asks for directions, the directions are provided, and they say goodbye. That works really well. And then the question is, where does he get this information? His coworkers have to look it up in a reference before they can provide it, whereas for this individual on the autism spectrum, this is one of his restricted, well, maybe we should call it a focused interest or a passion. And he's memorized this information, as many of us do in any, any area of special interest. So as a result, he can provide his information, the information to the customers much faster than his coworkers. So because this individual has autism, he outperforms his typical coworkers who don't have autism. So this is, this is how I think we need to take a look at autism, uh, not downplaying the real challenges that come with being on the autism spectrum, but there are many, there are still strengths that we need to be aware of. So significant challenges often come coupled with some significant strengths as well. So we've been talking for maybe about uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so. So before we carry on, uh, I figured I'd show my face a little bit and see if anybody had any questions before we go on to the next section. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. So I might have to have Marcy repeat any questions that are asked. Come on. Carol from Saskatoon would like to know how old you were when you were diagnosed even. Uh, all right, say that one more time. It didn't quite all get through. What year? Carol from Saskatoon would like to know what year or how old were you when you were diagnosed? Okay, well, I'll give you both. Uh, I was diagnosed in 1964, and I was two and a half years old, so... For that period of time, it was, you could consider that as a very early diagnosis. For sure. Thank you. Okay. And Tracy has a question. From She's with, with the service providers that have working with autism services. Okay. I'm asking this on behalf of my 13-year-old speaker. Okay. And she has a 13-year-old son on the spectrum. And he would like to know... Do you have any advice to give him on how he can be successful in achieving his career goals? Ooh, remind me to tell you about the new employment toolkit we have. Just came out three days ago. Her 13 year old son would like to know if he has, if you have any advice for him in achieving his employment goals. Well, it, it really depends on what those employment goals are. But in general, it's a matter of, of, of using one's interests and strengths. Uh, for those of us with autism, uh, our interests and strengths can be considerable. And in fact, we can get to situations where we know more about a particular subject than anybody in the region, uh, perhaps the country, or perhaps even the world. And the challenge for us is to use those interests or, in some cases, have to mold the, these interests uh, in such a direction that they can be conducive to employment. He's into aviation. Okay, well, aviation is good. I was into aviation as well. 
And if I wasn't scared away by math uh, from a teacher in third grade, then I might have become a pilot or something of that nature. Uh, ironically, he wants to go into either being a flight attendant or a customer service agent at the uh, check-in desk. Interesting. So that, it, that may be something he can do. It's important to know that uh, there's a lot of social interaction demands in terms of being a customer service agent. It doesn't mean that he can't do it, but it's just a, you just want to make sure that that doesn't provide a barrier. And if it does provide a barrier, then might there be something related that he can still do in aviation? Yeah, actually, the WestJet staff let him go behind the counter last summer. Uh huh. And he was tagging luggage and speaking to the guests like he had a blast. He was there for two hours. And they so, just let him ride out. So it sounds like it worked pretty well. Yeah. Cool. All right, then it sounds like a, an area that he should explore further. Cool. And it's good that he did this, you might say, unofficial uh, internship. That's great. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, move on to the next section and talk about sensory issues. Steven, can we have one more question? Uh, yeah, I think we can do one more. Okay. All right, I just wanted to ask you about the intervention. She wanted you to clarify the early intervention all right well that's a good question and in those days the term early intervention didn't even exist the concept didn't exist so if we look at it in today's terms we could call it we could refer to it as a home-based intensive early intervention program emphasizing music movement sensory integration narration and imitation and if you were to liken it to one of the more well-known approaches of today it would probably be a lot like one of the uh, developmental approaches such as the Miller method which is cognitive developmental or perhaps floor time or RDI which is which are more affective developmental so that's what my parents did and from their point of view probably just parents doing what they felt they needed to do in order to make contact with their child. And for each child it's going to be different. So what worked for me won't necessarily work for other people or they might in part they may work for other people. All right, so now we're going to roll along. We'll go back to the PowerPoint and we're going to uh, look at an activity. Uh, this time, uh, we're going to look at sensory issues. Sensory issues are a big part of autism. They are um, they're probably the most underrated aspect or challenge that people with autism have. It's only in the upcoming DSM-5, which will be released next month, that sensory issues have are being mentioned as a criteria for autism. And that's really good because I have yet to meet somebody with autism who doesn't have sensory issues. And there is one person that comes to mind who is a friend of mine on the autism spectrum. He says he doesn't have any sensory issues at all. But then again, I also wonder why the lights are off in his house and the shades are down. So that brings us to our sensory activity because we can spend a lot of time talking about sensory overload but to really get a good idea of what it's like it's important to experience it. So what we're going to do now and I'm going to call on Marcy to help guide this along is we're going to do this activity in groups of five, as you can see here. So we've got person number one. And person number one, that's you've got an easy job. All you do is you listen to what person number five is reading to you. So you can take a test on the material. And you ignore everybody else. And then the question is, what is everybody else doing? Well, person number two, 
you're going to stand behind person number one and you're going to take an index card or credit card or any piece of paper and kind of rub it against the back of person number one's neck. You don't do it hard, don't give them a paper burn, but you just do it repetitively. Then we have person number three. And you're going to grab a book or any sort of text and you lean very close to person number one, almost in the ear, and you read, you read that text in a loud voice. Then there's person number four. And person number four, you will pat them on their head and the shoulder at the same time. And then person number five uses a normal voice and at a normal distance, you read a second paragraph to person number one. And then you're going to ask them a few questions about what you read. And do that for just a, a paragraph is probably enough. And then you'll rotate so other people in the group can get a chance to be person number one. So this is something that uh, perhaps you can, do, you can do for the next uh, five or ten minutes. And then we'll report back to the group to see how everybody did. So Marcy, you ready to... Ready to turn them loose? Welcome to me. Yeah, okay. So maybe just do it by tables or join another table. So does everybody know what each person is doing? There are slides on their way over so you can read. Alright, I've got it. I'm making it bigger on the PowerPoint so that you can Perfect. Okay. see what needs to be done. And we have to stand up. Yeah, yeah, stand up. I'm making them stand up, Stephen. Pulling up my school teacher. Yeah, days. standing up's a good idea.
Take a couple of minutes to get back to our seats and then we'll talk about what happened. Okay. Sounded like a, people had a lot of fun. <laughs> All right, so who wants to talk about being person number one? All right. So who wants to talk about their experiences being person number one? Come on. He's going to get a word on this, so I'm not going to. Yeah, may Marcy, maybe you can find someone who is person number one. Who, whoever comes up here bit. Rise. <laughs> you are here. Okay, Jenna. Were you first number one? Yeah. Hey, see, you just gotta, you know, it's called motivators. <laughs> Bring a little 
therapy. <laughs> Hello. All right, I can hear you. I don't see you, but I can hear you. I came up on stage. Oh, there you are. You're way up there. Okay. <laughs> um, my experience. Um, my staff who works with me were picking who got to hit me and stuff. So for me, I was laughing a lot of, for the first little bit. So that made it really hard because I couldn't stop laughing at the beginning. But then I didn't hear almost one word from my friend who was talking in a normal tone. I couldn't uh -huh. concentrate at all. Yeah, it can be hard to concentrate. Do you know anybody with autism who has a hard time concentrating? Um, a few. Yeah, OK. So <laughs> I, maybe you have... I work at an adult group home and then on an intervention team with kids, too. So. I have had an experience with adults and with kids, so. Okay. All right, great. Yeah. So who else wants to talk about being person number one? Num number one, again? I see somebody walking up. Hi, Stephen. Good morning. Hello. Um, so what I was experiencing is at first I was overwhelmed by all the different noises and all the different touches that I was getting from somebody or different people. And then it was like one of them, one of those touches started giving me like the heebie-jeebies I call them, little tingles going down my arm and that's all I could think about was that sensation and um, how I was going to get that to stop. Because I started saying, okay, we have to stop that because I'm getting heebie-jeebies, but nobody was listening. Uh-huh. So have you ever seen that happen to any people with autism before? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's something that a lot of us experience. And do we have one more? Hi, Stephen. My name is Paxton. Hi, Paxton. So when I did person number one, I at first found it almost impossible to understand any of what was going on around me. And then when I started watching the mouth and lips of the person who, was, who I was supposed to be understanding, I found it possible to understand maybe 50% of what was being said. But it required an incredible focus. Um, which made me think of how focused some of the autistic people I know have to become when they work on something and why some of the people I work with don't answer me when I speak to them. And it made me wonder if it's because they're in that hyper-focused state. Were you able to hear me? Because I think the microphone was broken. Yeah, I can hear you. You were able to hear me, okay. That was my experience. I was able to catch maybe 50% of what was said to me as long as I really, really concentrated. But I imagine a whole day of that kind of concentration would be impossible, if not completely exhausting. Oh, sure. Yeah. I think you hit a lot of those issues right on the head. Imagine having to live through this uh, day in and day out. Stephen, and I have a question for you right now. Where say that again? I have a question for you. It's Marcy. Oh, okay. you, you're experiencing a bit of a multi-sensory thing right now, aren't you? Yeah, it is quite multi-sensory, yeah. So how are you feeling right now? I mean, I see the bright lights in the webcam, the, oh, probably all the background going like. Yeah, well, with the, uh, uh, through the webcam, uh, it looks like uh, it looks like that the uh, room is lit up brighter than you would find outside. But at the same time, uh, since it's only coming from a computer screen, and it's only about, uh, the image is only about, say, five by eight inches. Uh, that's much more tolerable than if the room was, was actually like the way it looks on the screen. So I think the screen is exaggerating what it's like in the room. And I think if it was in the, if it was, if the room was like it appears on the screen, then I think nobody would be sitting in this room. <laughs> because it would be too bright. 
And you know, the thing is, it's actually quite dark in here, Stephen. It's just a bunch of um, like pop lights shining down. Yeah, that's what that's what the screen is showing. And if you, yeah, I guess you can see your own screen looking back at you, and you can see uh, what it looks like to me. And for many of us on the autism spectrum, that is what the room can look like visually, very overstimulating. Uh, fortunately for me, this is just on a computer screen, and I can darken the computer screen if I want so that it doesn't appear too bright. So it's easy for me to modify. Uh, that was a good question. So thinking about what we just went through, you experienced a piece of what it's like for many of us on the autism spectrum. However, there are some differences to consider. One difference is that you knew this was going to be over in about five or ten minutes. Uh, the second difference has to do with expectations, whereas the expectation for you getting the right answer was somewhere between zero and none. What about the expectations for those students in school? So that adds additional pressure. So you've gotten a little bit of an idea of what it can be like for those of us with autism to struggle through many of these sensory challenges. So now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, go back to the PowerPoint and uh, let the fun continue. All right, so here we go. We're back with the PowerPoint, and in looking at the PowerPoint, uh, we're going to look a little bit more at sensory issues and then uh, move on to some other topics. And when we take a look at sensory issues, it's important to keep in mind the work of our friendly occupational therapists who consider the outer and inner senses uh, for those uh, on the autism spectrum. And the outer senses, we learn those in grade school, sight, touch, taste, hearing, and smell. Those are easy. There's inner senses also to keep uh, be aware of. And it's those inner senses that have to do with sensations that emanate from within the body. So we're talking about the vestibular, which helps you keep your balance, as well as proprioception, which tells you where your body parts are in space and how much force to use to accomplish a task. And what happens is that one or more of these senses can be oversensitive, creating what I call sensory violations, and there are others that might be undersensitive, which means not enough information comes into those senses. And what that means is that information from these senses tends to be unreliable and distorted. So uh, let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, many of us with autism perceive fluorescent lights like you perceive a strobe light. Now, a strobe light's fun on Halloween, but it does a real number on your productivity in school and at work or anything else. Imagine having to go through an entire day under a strobe light. Another type of lighting that's challenging is recess lighting and, or down lights, where there seems to be plenty of them in your... Uh, in that room that you're in. And I'm going to see if I can show a little video clip uh, about uh, these down lights. So we're going to see if this will show up uh, if this will show up through the Google Hangout. And we're going to find out very shortly. The video that I have on YouTube and the question I have is uh, can you see, do you see a video on, you, on, uh, on, uh, on your screen? Let's see if you, let's see, let's see if it shows up. Well, that's not the one that I want. Stephen, we're just still seeing your slides. You still, you still see the slide? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to go back to the slides. 
Back to the screen share. And here it is. Okay, and there are the slides. Uh, we may be able to watch it through the uh, screen share, so let's try that. I'm Stephen Shore, and I just have a brief message about uh, sensory issues. Uh, one common sensory challenge that those of us on the autism spectrum face is dealing with downlights. Well, downlights are those lights that look like they're in a coffee can in the ceiling, and they shine down and really create a bit of a whiteout sensation, a painful sensation in the eyes. And that's one reason why you'll see many people on the autism spectrum wearing a baseball cap like this, under fluorescent lights or under, light, uh, under down lights. So sitting under down lights can often look like uh, or feel like uh, looking at the spotlight. So you'll see many of us wearing a baseball cap. So the, uh, other sensory issues, some of you may know of children, or I should say know of parents who have to wait until their child's asleep, so they can cut half the head, and then hopefully they turn over and they can get the rest of the hair. So those are just some of the outer sensory issues, inner sensory issues, the vestibular sense that helps us keep our balance. Those of us who are hyposensitive, we seek sensory information. So for example, myself being hyposensitive, one of my favorite activities would be to ride my bicycle into a snowbank to go launching over the handlebars. Proprioception. That tells us where our body parts are in space and how much force to use to accomplish the task. And uh, many of us may have problems with that. Deep pressure helps calm the proprioceptive sense. If you happen to know anybody uh, who is like a bull in a china shop, you might say, and is clumsy, they often have difficulties with their proprioceptive sense. But for people on the autism spectrum, it's to a much greater extreme. So an example might be that a person with autism may not even know where their body ends and where the back of their chair begins. Now you take it for granted you know where the back of your chair is, but many people with autism may not know, may not have that ability. So that causes challenges as well. Now since I tend to be sensory seeking in both of these areas, and as I mentioned, as a child, running into snow banks to go launching over the handlebars of my bicycle was a favorite activity. Now I get my vestibular and proprioceptive input uh, another way. And that's part of the reason that I travel to conferences around the world. So far, I've been to 29 countries because it involves riding in airplanes. There's a lot of vestibular and proprioceptive input when an airplane takes off. And it gets even better when it goes through turbulence. So I enjoy riding through bumpy air and watching the wings flap up and down. And I know the wings flap up and down because the airplane is autistic and it's having a great old time. <laughs> so you know, I was uh, disappointed when I found that uh, scheduling just wouldn't permit me to come up in person because a good part of the fun of uh, speaking at conferences like this is actually sitting in an airplane and riding through those bumps. So as for sensory issues, here are a couple of good resources for sensory issues where, sens where these books do a good job in describing what sensory issues are and then what can be done, what type of interventions can be created to help with those sensory issues. So as moving along, we're going to take a magical musical mystery tour of the autism spectrum. And let's take a look at how we consider the autism spectrum. This is how we look at the autism spectrum now. The autism spectrum is a condition 
ranging from, as you can see, severe to light at the severe end is what most of society thinks of as autism, a small nonverbal child rocking in the corner, having difficulty with communication, having meltdowns. And it goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum, where we see people on the autism spectrum uh, 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 being employed, having families, but there's still many challenges uh, that we face. So we've got these subtypes ranging from severe, sometimes they're referred to as people at that end are referred to as having low functioning autism, people at the other end sometimes referred to as having high functioning autism. And uh, these subtypes are all going to go away with the DSM-5. So next month, they're not going to exist. There won't be any more PDD-NOS, for example, which many people considered as meaning a, a physician didn't decide. So now we're going to have just the autism spectrum. Everybody, as we were told in the early days, uh, when they were first talking about this, everybody who is in one of those subtypes would be subsumed into this big autism spectrum disorder, which in some cases, you know, there might be an argument to be made for this because instead of depending on subtypes, <coughs> it really causes the clinician or the educator or anybody else supporting an individual with autism really means that they have to look and see who that individual is and provide support based on their needs as opposed to getting tied up in uh, subtypes and perhaps limiting people as a result. So as we see in autism, there's also a great variation in abilities. And that's why I like to look at autism as being an example of twice exceptionality. So, for example, uh, you see my book, uh, Ask and Tell, that's my second book on self-advocacy. I found that there was very little discussion and education on self-advocacy. So I asked five of my colleagues, all who have autism, how are we going to best advocate for ourselves? And I think of one of the contributors, Cassiana Sibley, who has a verbal IQ of over 200. Now, those of you familiar with scoring IQ tests know they don't go that high, so it's just a guess. But at the same time, she has such significant challenges for social interaction that she's never going to find employment the way most of us think about finding and keeping a job. And we can also look at the other end, where I have another friend who has what we might, can, some people might consider, or might have considered as being low-functioning autism. Uh, that was her childhood diagnosis. Uh, it was actually a severe mental retardation. But then one day her father noticed her typing words into a computer. And perhaps he knew a little bit more than what people were suspecting. So we're now at a point where this person could interact with you just as I am, but she's still nonverbal, and she has a little bit of cerebral palsy, so she moves very awkwardly, very much like someone significantly, severely impacted intellectually as well. But get her on a keyboard, and she'll communicate with you just as well as anybody else. Later on, we found out that, that um, parts of the autism spectrum uh, were going to be cleaved off, at the lower end, we're going to see individuals who we think of as being pretty severely affected with autism and haven't developed a reliable means of communication, uh, considered as having a global delay. And at the other end of the spectrum, we will see people who uh, we now think of as having Asperger's syndrome and in some cases high-functioning autism being reclassified as having a social communication disorder or possibly a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And these two edges are not going to be considered as on the autism spectrum, but they'll be in other places, other accesses of the DSM. So there's two things to consider. One is the individuals who have these new diagnoses 
the easy part is that they're the same people that you've always knew and you already know what to do, how to support these individuals. The thing that we'll be challenged with is making sure that those individuals who now have new labels but still the same needs get the proper supports that they receive under autism spectrum diagnosis. Now, if we're looking at the DSM numbers, the DSM-5, you'll notice the switch from Roman numerals to Arabic numerals. And the hope is, according to the committee, is that they'll be able to make more frequent updates than maybe once every 10 years, going from a particular edition like the DSM-4 and then the DSM-4 text revised. So we might be seeing 5.1, 5.2, and, and so on. Well, I like circles, and I like things that spin. So that's why I put that there. And in the middle, it shows about where I landed on the autism spectrum at 18 months when the autism bomb exploded. And there were some significant challenges in social interaction, but I still had some awareness of the environment. So moving along, there I am at two and a half, and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I, that's when I got my diagnosis, and fortunately my parents refuted the professional's recommendations of institutionalization, but rather they figured out that imitating me and making me aware of them and my environment, they were able to move me along. As we zoom up to age four, uh, speech was beginning to come back. We got reevaluated. Instead of being considered as psychotic and ready for an institution, I got upgraded to neurotic, so things were moving up in the world. I discovered watch motors. So what I would do is with a sharp kitchen knife, I'd pop open the back of a watch, take out the hands, the gears, everything else, and then put it all back together again. The watch still worked, and there weren't any pieces left over. So incredible fine motor control to take apart a watch, but the question is, where did that motor control go when it came to penmanship? And that was a question that I wondered about for a long time, and I think that at least some of the answer has to do with structure. Watch motors and other mechanical devices are very structured, uh, whereas the physical act of writing is less structured. And additionally, uh, the physical act of writing, uh, we got the motor control issues, uh, which causes a lot of challenges. So one of the worst experiences I could have in grade school would be to walk into a room with a paragraph on the board, because that suggested that it was going to be a copying session. It would take me all class period to get through one word, or two or three words, and everybody else will, had already gone to recess. Unfortunately, now we know how to help people with autism who have the physical, physical challenges in writing, either using a keyboard device or an iPad or some alternate means, and they're demonstrating that they've mastered material. And that's something that both parents and educators want to be aware of, that when something like the physical act of writing, or it could be anything else, is presenting a challenge, you don't want it to be present a barrier for demonstrating mastery of material. So in other words, uh, for students who I've seen doing poorly on written assignments, because they have difficulty with the physical act of writing, then we need to find another way for them to demonstrate mastery of the material. It could be orally, it could be by showing a teacher, it could be ty by typing on a computer, uh, whatever works. Because when you're testing for mastery on material, that's, you want to be clear that that's what you're testing for, as opposed to writing. Now, you may want to give a child a writing test to test for their writing ability, and that's, that's something different. So it's important to be clear as to what you're writing on, uh, what you're testing on. So continuing along, uh, my parents noticed this behavior, 
And instead of looking at it as a closed door of aberrant behavior that needed to be stopped, uh, they supported this interest and soon provided all kinds of other devices to take apart. So more watches, clocks, radios, and they sat with me and made sure I got these things back together again. And I think that demonstrate the, this demonstrates the importance of parental involvement in fostering interest. So had it been an earlier century, it probably would have been a really good watchmaker or repairman. Uh, fortunately, I was able to transfer this mechanical interest to bicycles, and uh, bicycles became another special interest, which was very helpful in earning money going through college. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So building a sense of self-awareness is very important for individuals uh, on the autism spectrum, and something that's often not discussed in enough detail. So anyways, getting back to the idea of handwriting, imagine what it would be like to write your name in cursive using your non-dominant hand. So let's all try that for a moment. Take a pen or pencil and sign your name without lifting your pen. Sign your name in your non-dominant hand, which means if you're right-handed, do it on the left hand, and if you're left-handed, do it with your right hand. So let's just spend a couple of moments doing that. Grab a pen or pencil and sign whatever piece of paper you have in front of you, and we'll talk about how that felt. Stephen, I'm pretty sure everybody has copies of the slides now, so... Oh, that's good. Would uh, we like to see Stephen or slides? Stephen, not hands up? We'd like to see you now, Stephen. All right, well, here I am. All right, so let's talk about how how it felt to sign your name using your non-dominant hand. Who wants to who wants to tell us how it felt? Do we have a volunteer. Do we have a volunteer? Hi, Stephen. It felt um. I just didn't have control over what I was doing, so it was really weird. All right, so it felt a little weird. You didn't have as much control as you wanted. Who else wants to talk about how they felt? Anyone? You know I'll come to you. Hi, I'm Clara. It feels really awkward. It feels like you should use your right hand. All right, so it felt awkward. One more. I'm Stephen. Um, it felt very difficult. I had to uh, concentrate extremely hard on each movement I was making, and uh, just really difficult. All right. So it took a lot of concentration. It felt awkward, and that gave you a little bit of an idea of what it can be like for somebody with autism to get through their school day, doing things that are awkward for them, that are difficult uh, for them, that are difficult uh, in terms of academics or even just motor control. All right, it looks like we're getting close to lunch, so we'll buzz through a few more topics, and then we'll break for lunch, and then after that, uh, the fun will uh, continue. The fun. We'll, we'll continue. So we're going to flip back and forth between the screen and uh, between uh, uh, my my talking. So uh, let's do a little screen sharing. Stephen, while you're doing that, have you seen our new video that we put out? That cartoon called "My Name Is David." Uh, what what video was that? It's called My Name is David. It's about sensory issues. 
Uh, no, I haven't seen that video. If, uh, I, if you if it's online and you send me a link, I think that would be pretty cool to see. Yeah, I'm gonna show it to them after, and I'll send you the link. Okay, yeah. If you send me the link, then maybe I'll watch it while uh, you're showing it to them. Uh, on my com I can watch it on my computer. So that that would probably be very helpful. So moving along, what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, talk about disclosure. Disclosure. So by the time I was six years old, I entered regular school kindergarten where I was a social and academic catastrophe. You know what happens to students who are different in grade school. So there was a lot of bullying, unfortunately, a lot of teasing. And I just didn't know how to get along with my classmates. And my classmates didn't know how to get along with me either. I guess uh, walking around the room saying the letter B over and over uh, didn't endear me to my classmates. And my teachers didn't know how to reach me. I was usually about a grade behind in most of my subjects. So grade behind in most of my subjects, uh, uh, sometimes even wondering, uh, was being surprised that I was promoted to the next grade level. However, I did have my special interests. So I'd go into the library and I'd pull all the books on whatever it might be. Aviation was one of them as I was uh, talking to, uh, I think it was a parent a little bit earlier, world history, volcanoes, earthquakes, weather, cats, uh, whatever it was, uh, I would get involved in my special interest and sometimes wonder if was, there was more to the school day than just reading my favorite books, like doing math in groups or something of that nature. But I think what it translated to is that teachers didn't know how to reach me, but at the same time, since I wasn't a behavior problem, they just left me to my own devices, for better or for worse. And I think in those days, when there was so little known about autism, it was probably for better rather than for worse. And also what we see happening is often we'll see students or individuals beginning to wonder about their differences. Why are things so different for them than they are for other people? And here comes the idea of disclosure. How do you tell somebody with autism that they have autism? And how do you do it in a way that explores that focuses on characteristics, focuses on characteristics and addressing the challenges that an individual with autism has, but at the same time recognizing, recognizing them for their strengths. So fiddling around here with the controls uh, to see if we can uh, take a look at a couple of slides. And it doesn't seem to want to do that, so we'll have to we'll look at them a little bit later. But anyways, you've got them in front of you. And if you look at the slide on disclosure, uh, you'll see that I've developed a four-step approach in which to tell somebody with autism that they have autism. And the question is, how do you do that? Uh, I was lucky in this regard because my parents used the word autism in the house for as long as I can remember. So since about age four, when my speech had pretty much normalized, I knew I had this thing called autism. Didn't know much about what it was, but it certainly helped explain an awful lot of differences. And I think that is how, that, I think that is how uh, discussion of autism uh, should take place. There shouldn't be this uh, discrete uh, period when you tell somebody that they have autism but it just should be an ongoing discussion, just as you might talk about somebody having brown hair or brown eyes or blonde hair. Uh, but unfortunately, most people don't learn about having autism that way. So then the question becomes, how do we tell someone? And therein comes the four, uh, the four points. So let's take an example of a child that I worked with 
Uh, starting at age five and a half, he has Asperger syndrome. His parents refused to use the word autism in the house because they just knew with enough intensive activity with early intervention, I the Asperger syndrome right out of him. Now, when we move ahead to his teenage years, and we find that he still has Asperger's syndrome. And his parents realize that this Asperger's syndrome is here to stay. As a matter of fact, it's more pronounced now than when he was five and a half, uh, most likely because the demands of life have gotten so much more complicated. So his parents realized that their son needed to be told, and they asked me to do the deed. They asked me to do the deed, and I said, well, uh, it's a dirty job, and Bruce Wayne isn't available. He's busy playing Batman, so I guess I'll do it. So then we started the next session by talking about his strengths in music, graphic design, computers. We also talked about his challenges in social interaction, uh, making friends, and penmanship. And he got that pretty quickly. We then moved on to the second step. The second step involved uh, looking at strengths, challenges, lining them up. I call that lining up the challenge, lining them up, or racking them up. And in this step, uh, we put the strengths on one side of a piece of paper, challenges on another, and we looked at what strengths we could use to accommodate a challenge. And we found that since he was so good at computers, he might as well just write his paper, papers using the computer instead of by hand. He thought that was a good idea. But an important aspect of this step is to uh, find a strength to accommodate for a challenge. And also, I don't use the word weakness because weakness is too static of a word. And it's too negative. But you can work about a, uh, you can work th through a challenge, over it, or overcome it. We then moved on to non-judgmental comparison. We looked at other people's strengths, his family members, others he knows. And the idea is that different people have different strengths and different challenges, and we use our strengths to lead fulfilling and productive lives. We then moved on to look at uh, uh, we, then we moved on to present to step four, which is uh, presenting the label. And before I do that, I talk about scientists and doctors who study people's characteristics. And it just so happened to be that his set of characteristics lined up with what is known as Asperger syndrome. And this took us about 15 minutes to get through. Uh, for some people, it takes a lot longer. Uh, you know, however much time it takes, it's really dependent uh, on that individual uh, and, and their needs. And, uh, and I wasn't sure that he understood what we were talking about. Uh, so then three weeks later, I asked his father, how did your son do with the, uh, uh, with, with the disclosure? And Dad said, my son, he loves having Asperger's syndrome. Well, he did get it, because now he understands why he is the way he is. And what that does is the label becomes the final piece of the puzzle, you might say, so that the individual is able to say, so this is what it's called. This is what is causing the challenges. And that's what we're looking for in doing a disclosure. And again, for some people, it will take a, may take a longer period of time. Others, it will be in a shorter period of time. And I find disclosure is often done completely backwards. And what I mean by that is that the label is presented first. You know, you have autism, and then the person is already anxious and fearful for what they might have, and then the rest of the time is spent explaining it away. But by going through a characteristics-based approach, then the label just becomes a nice summary for what the situation is. And only when a person has a full understanding of what it means to them to have Asperger's syndrome, to build a framework of understanding around what it means to have Asperger's syndrome or autism, then they can move on to self-advocacy. 
and making their needs known in a way that others can understand and provide support. So when we get back, we're going to talk about self-advocacy. And before we leave, uh, before we break for lunch, uh, the question that I have for you is, uh, how many of you have advocated for yourself? And I see a bunch of hands. I should actually see every hand going up, including Marcy's hand go up. Everyone is self-advocated. And we'll take a look at uh, what I mean by that and how we need to take a look at unpacking what is involved in self-advocacy so that we can teach individuals with autism how to effectively advocate on their own. So I see that it's 11 o'clock. And I'll turn it over to Marcy, and uh, we'll continue after lunch. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to put, um, yeah. I'm going to put that uh, video on this screen. So um, I, again, everybody, I know I'm, you're, I'm talking to you with my back to you, but I can't get one of these other computers. There's supposed to be two internet connections right here. There's only one. And my iPhone doesn't have enough power to patch off of or if the video's too big. So um, again, if you want copies of all of these, let me know. I will get them to you. And I'd be happy to even just burn some of them tonight. This is a video. It did float around on Facebook, but Autism Speaks produced it this year. A sec, I just gotta log into the VMO here. Are you still there, Stephen? Yeah, I think I am. Yeah. Um, I bet if you went to our website and searched "My name is David," that'd be the fastest. Uh, but I. Uh, I think that's what I'm gonna do. So, just tell me what your website is. AutismSpeaks.org. Or here oh, okay. It's the, it's the general autism speak. Website. Yeah, you okay. know what? Give me one second. So I'm going to it as you're going to it. Okay, I'm in um, my Gmail account, Stephen. So what's your email again? Uh, it's. Uh, Tumbalaika at AOL.com, or you can even just copy and paste it to, uh, um, yeah, okay, why don't you do that? Just send it to me as an email. T-U-M-B-A-L-A-I-K-A at AOL.com. Okay, so we're going to watch it right now. All right. I'll go watch it too. Okay, class, okay, settle down. Before we get started, Dave has something he'd like to read to us. Hello, my name is David, and I am autistic. I look like most of the voices that I have many of the same interests, but I am different in many ways. Autism causes me to behave differently than what you may think or expect. I have difficulties with some things that most people don't have trouble with. People with autism have challenges in social situations. I often have a hard time understanding people. Most people can understand expressions and body language which tells you about what a person is thinking and feeling. I have difficulties with metaphors such as, hold your socks up. I think you are telling me to pull my socks up, but now I understand that you may be. Pay attention. This is because I think literally and expect the words to mean what they say. Most people have sensory problems. They may feel very sensitive to what they taste, smell, see, or hear. But autistic people have a difficult time handling them. These difficulties are not exactly the same for everyone. 
If I am in a crap place with loud noises, it can hurt my ears, so reduce the noise I cover my ears. I do not like to be hyper-kissed unless I'm the one who is doing it. Getting my teeth clean was not easy. It took my parents a long time to find a dentist who understood my sensitivity. She explains what is going to happen ahead of time, and she asks me to touch and feel the instruments before she puts them in my mouth. She works with me slowly and does not force me to do anything I don't want her to do. Kids with autism generally like to talk about topics that interest them only. For example, I like to talk about sports, trades, or Legos. I feel safe and confident when I talk about things I like a lot. Sometimes I forget that not everyone is interested and I talk about them too much. I might need help in changing the subject. I'm not able to read your face and see that you are bored. So just tell me and I will do my best to listen. I used to have a difficult time traveling, waiting lines, going through airport security, or the plane being late caused anxiety for me. But now that I've traveled a lot, I am more flexible with not knowing everything before traveling. My parents would talk to me ahead of time, explain as best they could every detail, and that has taught me to ask questions now before doing anything they do. My brain is very good at storing facts and figures, but I have difficulties with reading comprehension and using words correctly. Some of us are fortunate to be more high functioning than others. Having autism has advantages. I can easily tell you the capitals of every state, coaches of every NBA basketball team, they won't know your baseball teams and what city they are in. I am very, very absorbent. I can watch a basketball player make a free throw and copy him, or watch a bowler make a strike and imitate his arm for a bit. That helps me be a better bowler and basketball player. Autism is a condition that affects the way the brain processes information. Not everyone has autism and is not an illness. It will not go away. No one knows exactly why people have autism. I will always have autism, but as I grow up with the help of friends and family, I can learn a lot of things that come naturally to most people. You can help me by understanding that I have autism, and by not making fun of me. You can tell your friends and family what you have learned about autism. Being patient and understanding with all of us who have autism will support us greatly. Thank you. Stephen, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. So, what did you think of that? I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was a good explanation as to what autism is and how it can uh, affect an individual with autism. I thought it was a nice way of, uh, of describing it. and. Now that I know that that video exists, I'll probably use it for my classes. <laughs> I don't know, but did anybody feel that sometimes things were pretty like black and white, like not every child on the spectrum likes to be a your kiss or like some of those really strong generalizations? So obviously they do their very best to touch on everything, but you know. Um, so that's a video they produced um, again. With uh, in the family services uh, with dollars that are raised at the walks, so I will be more than happy to put that in your hands for you to share and, and use that to educate people. So yeah, so Stephen, we will see you back at um, first of all, schedule and I didn't uh, work here. We are doing our Q and A at twelve thirty-five. Okay. So, I left. Um, I did the 1235, I don't know, the school teacher in me helps you remember what time you're supposed to be back. Um, so please take some time to come up with some, some really good singers for Stephen. Right, Stephen? Good question. Oh, I'm ready. You know, the idea was to get as much out of this as you guys can. Um, and the reason, do we all feel that we, we need an hour? I love the hour and a half because we do, you know, we're next door to Paul and there's any time to get lunch and stuff. So, okay. So we will see you back here. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. We'll see you in a bit. Okay, see you in a bit. Okay. Bye bye.
Um, but you know what I'll do is I'll just use this one. It's totally fine. Like I've got the for lunch for internet and for everything because it's all working. This on one? Here. Yeah. Okay. I, I just uh, it's brand new. Like I just got it oh, a week okay. ago. The only thing is I'm not sure if it has PowerPoint so that I can run my PowerPoint on it. I can. So I was just gonna double check that right now. Let's. We could still use the two. I just I couldn't get. This guy working. Yeah, and that's fine. I just okay. Uh, that one I don't have a switch right. Now. <laughs> just. I was going to say, I, had to, I could simplify things a little bit, but if you, that would simplify. Yeah, but this one, I don't know. This is how I do the four and hotels and stuff with this computer, and it's because. Well, initially, I know what happened. Initially, it was the wireless was on, and when you have wireless and wired on, it doesn't know which one to use, and it causes a conflict. And I even went in here and tried this and, and tried. No, it's not us. It's going to try to find everybody at one more time. Oh, 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 oh. Because I, I did have it. Nothing else has changed. We had a brief place. I don't know. And that's why what's happening sometimes I have had is the wireless and the wire. I was patching up my iPhones and one. Yeah, it's not the easiest. Trying to use that one. Yeah. I just yeah. worried to. And that way you wouldn't have to switch the projector either. That's what I was. I was coming in here. I had a solution for that to simplify things, but this would be even easier. I'm. I'm just not familiar with Windows 8. <laughs> yeah, you know it's. Uh, very similar. It's just pretty much when you. Uh, it's the getting that some of the menus and that know, that I. Go, like, down to the bottom corner. Yeah, it's like where it's the program. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to find right now, and I'm like. I know it's really weird. It'll just tell me. I, I guess you'll find out if you try and open it. And worst case, maybe it'll just download a trial or something. Well, it has Outlook. So it might have PowerPoint Viewer, which is not one you can't create them, but you can view them. I think I did put it on. I installed my whole window Word. Okay. Let's see PowerPoint. Make sure it says Word version. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, we're in. Is it something that you you want to change or anything? No. I'm not sure if it's power. Unlicensed. You might not be able to make like let's say you wanted subscription to subscription expired. Most features are disabled. Okay, there we are. Hello. Hi, Marcy. Hi. Hi, it's this. <laughs> oh, there's a uh, Caroline and I were working on some statistics here during the lunch break and just thought we'd say hi. Okay. Sounds What's good. Like there? I, I, don't, like? I don't have your web uh, up right now. We're trying to fix techie stuff, so don't feel like you need to talk to me. <laughs> no, no, we just thought we'd talk to you before we got started, that's all. <laughs> okay. All right, bye. All right, take care. Do you want me to give you the rundown? <laughs> that's, good. that's pretty much where I eat every day, almost. <laughs> there's, there's Subway, there's A&W, there's Taco Time, there's an Opa, Greek, uh, there's a Korea, Korean barbecue place, two different Chinese places, Manchu, Booster Juice. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, you know what I'll do? I'll text you. Okay. Instead of trying to remember. <laughs> so it looks like it's all. Now, can I change? It's so different <laughs> that I'm not. Uh... Oh, this age drives me that far right now. Oh, look at that, eh? I just want to make sure that. There's nothing really. Okay, so. Okay, and. So that was. Okay. No problem. Okay, unlicensed. Okay, what is this? So, yeah, you might not be able to make any edit. I'm not sure. Like, it might be something you're, or you might not be able to save. Well, what I'll do then is just download them and put it in, and I got an hour and a half here, so. <laughs> okay. No break for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll download them off this computer and then. Because. Uh, there's some videos I have to pull off of the email site. Oh, okay. And I was I couldn't even get my stupid other computer to do wired at the hotel last night and Oh really? It's, it's serves me right. I it's bec we have a very high level of security oh, because okay. autism speaks. So I'm sure IT like I can't even uh, put a software on, like update a Java script. Yeah. I have to call IT and they have to do it. Oh, okay. So it's probably something. Um, yeah, with their, the way the network. They've, they've, well, they've probably got the it network. set up to. That's, we have the same problem here, too. We have three laptops that we. I want to buy Office? Oh, no. No, I don't want to buy it. I have it. <laughs> OK, so all you have to do it on that one. Yeah, so I suppose you could yeah, yeah. make all the changes on there, yeah. save it. <laughs> Yeah, it's totally fine. It's all good. Yeah, so and I don't know. So I just rebooted this one and I was thinking maybe we'd get lucky and I could get the wire to work on here. I'm not too worried. I'll figure it out. We're good. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure everyone was I if you want to continue, I had a, a box that you wouldn't have to go to the projector and then switch it, but if you're just gonna be using one Laptop now. Yeah, and the switching is really good. It's totally fine. Again, the, the videos that I have posted on the internet, like that last one, I just need to just put it on there. Okay. It's a pretty easy going crowd. It's, this is a free presentation we give them, so yeah. it's not like I, you know, they fill out a feedback and say, well, the presentation wasn't organized, as <laughs> I don't really care because it's free. <laughs> but yeah, it's all good. So thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate it. Oh, Got your run around like. <laughs> I didn't know. I'm like, okay, I've never seen this Google like, Hangout. Yeah. Hangout, and I'm like, I've never seen it before. And 
I've never and, heard and of it. His, and I know I knew exactly what was wrong on his end, but I can't explain how to do it. Yeah, what it is. We're seeing a lot of presenters do that now with their PowerPoint. You can set it up to have. You see the full screen up here, and then you get that row, just what he was yeah. showing. Yeah, well, he forgets here. to go. Yeah. And you can change it depending on how it is, if you're left handed or right handed, too. Oh. So he could have changed it so it would swap. Mm -hmm. And I, even when I do it, I have to search for it to, to figure that out, kind of thing. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. We're getting a lot of presenters now that do that, and then you have to set it to extend your desktop. Yep. I'm just going to download the. Oh, what's that I need? On oh, this one, I need this one. Tomorrow, I'm trying to think, it'll be Courier Chris. Uh, will be the text thing in the morning. Um, they'll get you up and running, but they're probably going to be kind of quiet. Well, once I kind of know, yeah, <laughs> then I could just do it myself. It's been fun to like, I, you know, I don't mind helping. I'm glad to help, but I know those guys have. To, we're we're getting really really busy again tomorrow, so there's like mm -hmm. five or six other events going on. Whereas today, I think there's one other than you guys. Oh yeah, well I think that's why they put us up here. Okay, all good. I'm just going to sit here and put around this, these videos. I'm going to try to just embed them so I don't have to worry about the okay, internet. Yeah. Are you still going to use this computer at all? Like I was going to say, I can get rid of some of these clutter of these cables if you're not going to be, or it doesn't even matter to you. I don't care. <laughs> We're good. Cords are cords. Okay. Nobody's watching it anyway. You're watching him. <laughs> and they are going to have to listen to me, but it's all good. <laughs> 